Welcome back to the news! Okay, right, a lot of things have went down, so let's just get stuck into it, starting off with the Dragonflight updates. Decently big milestone, actually, because the beta's here, and now we have got level 70 pre-made characters, so this is a good, good big step. Now, they are restricted to just Stormwind and Orgrimmar, and not a whole lot of content uh, yet, so they are trying to do things in a bit more of a focused way, but at least we can test full talent builds, which is definitely nice. Of course, over time, Mythic Plus and Raiding will make it in, but first, they're going to be doing the uh, Raided Solo Shuffle with a round of testing next week. So, it'll be interesting to see how, well, solo queued conquest earning PvP with Raiding is going to feel. Also, we've got the Season 1 Dungeon Pool, right, for Mythic Plus. Ruby Life Pools, Algathar Academy, Noku Defensive, Azure Vault, and then for the returning dungeons, Halls of Valor, Court of Stars, Shadow Moon Burial Grounds, and the Temple of the Jade Serpent. You know what? Those are four returning dungeons that uh, I really like, but I would say, Blizzard, don't be cowards. Inflict Skyreach upon the people. Maybe I'm just a sadist. Okay, we then just have a whirlwind of little changes for the expansion. So, here is a uh, map. Uh, yeah, here's where the Isles are in an increasing, increasingly crowded and uh, not a scale world map. For talents then, a nice new little feature where Blizzard are adding in suggested starter builds for people. Uh, this is just really great, and the good thing is it works not by preloading a whole build at once, but it actually guides somebody talent by talent through making a build. So hopefully they will A, not feel overwhelmed, and B, actually learn something. Then, gearing. Well, gearing in raids is a bit more different now because it spans four item level brackets within the same difficulty instead of just the final two bosses being a higher item level. Basically, it's just more granular rewards. I wonder if that'll cause any loot table funk, but I suppose Blizzard's overall intent is just that you progress, uh, you know, as you progress to harder bosses, you do just get better loot, right? So I think they just want to do that to try to make their raids feel a bit more rewarding. And I suppose also have the item level actually reflect that difficulty curve. Leveling then. So, XP. They have uh, brought back uh, the XP to its heavily nerf values, and this absolutely crushes the likes of level 50 to 60, which of course you'll be able to do in Chromie time. And I suppose overall this probably means that 1 to 70 will take about as long as 1 to 60 will. They've also rescaled some item levels for loot to just make that whole thing a bit more smooth. Class changes. There's actually been quite a lot of them then. So there is a bit of a drama with warriors who can now get a mass grip, but it targets only, well, only four targets and 10 yards range, and it increases heroic leaps cooldown by 45 seconds. So initially people were worried it was way too much and the DKs felt a bit hard done by, but now like it's nice utility, but you certainly will pay for it. For the Hunters, then, there was also a little bit of utility drama, where Binding Shot was turned into a route that would, consistent with other routes, break with damage. And uh, following clear, instant, and uh, pointed feedback, it's now a three-second stun, rather than a, um, yeah, rather than what have uh, otherwise been. So I suppose a bit of a win there. And for the Warlocks, you are getting Spell Lock added back to your Fell Hunter because they wanted to keep that part of the class fantasy. Then, for what seems to be my new main class, Priest, we've got some more business. Now, with Renew and Flash Heal being Disc's new bread and butter for Spreading Atonement, they are considering just doing some pruning-like things, like uh, removing Shadow Mend, and they said that overall they're happy with the class and spec trees. But that said, there is a funky thing. Silence won't be added to the class tree, and that means that Holy and Disc are the only two specs in World of Warcraft that don't have uh, an interrupt. A Blizzard said, like, yeah, you know, not everybody has to have everything, but it does feel a bit weird when the other 36 do. So, uh, yeah, who uh, who knows there? I mean, you could maybe let it be taken, but put it into a less convenient part of the class talent tree? Ah, I'm not really sure. Uh, dispersion is going to remain shadow only, and Shining Force is being removed. Uh, they just cited a broad availability of knockbacks um, and also some PvP concerns, and even though it's not elegant, they could just make it not work in players if they wanted to. So look, there's there's good and there's bad here. At a very basic level, the Renew and Flash Heal change seems pretty good to me. 
uh, but there are some outstanding concerns, and I'd recommend, if you are a priest, hit up uh, Jack's video for, uh, I guess, a more educated breakdown and things, because I am but only a newbie priest. Balanced Druids, then. You guys have got an update, too, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really pretty damn chunky one. And it does represent a lot of druid changes too, because of course, Feral got a whole raft of changes uh, a little while ago as well, which uh, definitely has been good because they've, they've been due a lot for a long time. Okay, balance then. Not only has your Mastery Total Eclipse been redesigned into Mastery Astral Invocation, but uh, Star Surge, Star Fall, and the general behavior of Eclipses have also been, uh, have been redesigned. So that's quite something. And you know, it's kind of interesting to me because the changes that they've made, I mean, um, like the eclipses, they uh, they no longer, uh, you know, have to be like one than the other. So you can just stay in whatever eclipse makes the most sense for the situation that you're in. Um, in a way that could maybe be a little bit more dull, but also there was like a lack of control in the eclipses. And essentially this is them really combating feedback that they got in the alpha of Shadowlands. So uh, yeah, I guess they, kind of only just got around to it. Now for the hunters, this ain't a class change thing, but it is kind of nice, and it's the taming of lesser dragon kin. That actually does include a few neat dragons in the Shadowlands as well. So a nice little thing. On to more updates then. Well, we've got a raft of UI updates. We've got this, which is the Dragon Isles, like, content window thing, uh, with the reps and the dragon uh, riding talents and stuff on it. It looks pretty nice, and also here's the new player frame, which I do think looks quite slick and they've also added more to the edit mode. It's not complete yet, and it certainly is not a full replacement to Alve UI, but it is a massive improvement to the baseline experience of World of Warcraft, and I suppose the hope is that at least for some players, it will be enough to just do what they want. Okay, a few tidbits then. So there's a progress bar for the Dragon Isles Dockmaster, which uh, I guess means you won't miss the boat, I think it's like a little bit obtuse just being a bunch of UI slapped into the game world, but eh, whatever. Uh, moving on then, soul shape. So actually your soul shape is staying around via a new toy that you can pick up from Lady Mun in the new expansion. It's got a 10 minute duration and five minute cooldown, which does mean a 100% uptime, but it is just a cosmetic effect. Uh, but still, this is good. Obviously Blizzard had to sunset all that Shadowlands borrowed power. I'm just happy that, you know, for the players who like went and collected all the soul shapes, they're not shit out of luck now. So overall then, where we are is basically endgame testing is about to start soon enough. That will cover the dungeons and the raids, and they're starting off with solo shuffle. Overall, this does mean that we are rapidly moving towards the finish, which of course we would have to because this expansion is coming out within three months, maybe two and a half months. And that means that a bunch of systems have got to be ready for perhaps one and a half months time when the pre-patch goes live, which will contain the class changes and all those things uh, like that. And I suppose what I will say is that by this stage in Shadowlands, we had a significantly larger number of dramas going on. I mean, do you remember talking about the ripcord, talking about conduits, people wondering when the mob was going to like have more things to do in it, all that. There is so much more drama by this stage in that. Uh, and certainly there was still loads of drama by this stage in Battle for Azeroth, where it's really Dragonflight, like it, it does have a lot of class feedback and plenty of iteration to do, but there's no major foundational drama, which is certainly a good sign. And also if you want to test this stuff yourself, well, you might not have beta access, but Dragonflight pre-patch is on the public test realm, so uh, you'll just be able to copy your live character over and just see how it feels. And before Wrath Classic, a little bit on modern. Right, gold restrictions have seemingly disappeared from character transfers, and based on Wowhead's follow-up investigation of that using Wayback Machine, it looks like this happened sometime after August 11th. Now, they tested moving 2.6 million gold, and it worked. So this is a subtly big change, at least for some people. I mean, there's actually some players of the game who earn loads of gold by just exploiting market differences like between servers. And they can actually make so much gold by doing that, that all their server transfer costs are uh, paid for by battle.net balance. So the people who enjoy that will certainly, uh, certainly enjoy how they can move their money around a lot more easy now. 
Then the only other thing for Modern is um, actually kind of neat. So they did this thing, Zymox's Cash. It was a charity event with uh, Liquid and Echo. It's just a neat little, I think, two hour-ish long uh, event that they hosted over on, I think, Twitch or their YouTube, whatever. Um, but what's cool about it is that it featured dual fated affixes being turned on to spice up the challenge for the guilds. And now they've just went ahead and added that to the live game. Now, you're not going to get any more loot if you activate two of these affixes. It's just there as a neat option, so I think that's kind of nice. And there's actually a few cases where the boons that you can get from those new faded affixes can actually make the fights easier. Next then, the big impending thing, Wrath Classic. So then, the release schedule is out, and it's quite nice for us uh, in and around Europe, because 10 a.m., which is uh, perfect for a full day of Goblin Mode gaming. Demand, though, has been absolutely humongous, and that has led to some woes. Uh, first off, we've got two new PvP Fresh Start Realms being added, which likely is to help with congestion and maybe fill a bit of a gap. Now, people have been having, like, big queues to get onto Battle.net, and then big queues to queue for the game. <laughs> And the queuing can actually take six hours in some of the mega servers, which is crazy. And Blizzard are targeting that problem by disabling incoming paid transfers, locking the realms indefinitely, and offering free outbound transfers. It's this thing that's happened where the community's basically thought like, shit, we have to go to the mega servers. Those are the only ones that are viable to play on. And that broad community perception, according to Blizzard, isn't exactly... Uh, well, A, something that they can fix by just throwing more hardware at the problem, and also isn't as much of a thing as the community thinks it is, because there are some servers that are not being considered as viable as the Mega Realms, but those realms have actually got two, two and a half, three, four times the concurrency of 2008 servers. So, fairly interesting. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of people coming back for Wrath Classic, and of course, Blizzard you know, they're not going to open a humongous amount of servers because, you know, if they opened, you know, all that stuff for the initial rush, and obviously there's going to be an attrition, then they could be left with too many servers and players spread too thin, and that could probably exacerbate the mega server problem. So I think it's the sort of thing where ideally you do want to get away with the smallest number of servers that will do the job. Interesting. Now, some of the players logging in have been doing so to unlock the Frostblood Proto Worm mount on the live game. It's a cross promo Blizzard are doing, and you get it for completing the DK starting experience. And if the prospect of leveling a character up to 55, or maybe even buying a boost <laughs> so that you can then make a DK, if that seems funny to you, uh, don't worry, because you can actually make a Death Knight on a fresh, like, classic account. Um, without having to get another character up to level 55, providing you're not doing it on a fresh start server. And I guess for me, like, in fairness to Blizzard, the mount looks great, and with all of this being under the same subscription, I'm not going to begrudge them some cross-promotion. Now, unfortunately, not all was smooth with the pre-patch event, and Look, this led to a massive blue post. I'll basically just make it simple. There was internal confusion and miscommunication that led to confused players who didn't know what to expect. And we're now at a situation where they've essentially rebuilt a whole bunch of the pre-patch event to operate in a more modern fashion. And things are uh, now going to be proceeding more smoothly, where the invasions will play out until Wrath launch. The Cure Quest is live in Shatrath right now, and cities will come under attack as of Monday 19th. So, yeah, I think that may have been mild crisis mode at the office for a while. Now, there has been a bit of a drama, actually, where there is a hotfix that's allowing people to queue for a BG anywhere, not just at the Warmaster NPC. And I know that to a lot of modern players who didn't play back then, that might seem insane and you won't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you could not queue for a battleground when you're out in a zone. You had to go to a Warmaster NPC in a major city. And that meant that the PvPers would be congregating around the Warmasters. Um, yeah. So it's a bit of an odd thing making this change because you can't queue for a dungeon anywhere. You have to go to the Summoning Stone. So the philosophy feels a little bit inconsistent, and I think some people don't like the idea of depopulating those, like, common PvP social areas. Uh, so yeah, Blizzard have definitely received some pushback on that one. 
And finally, what about Cataclysm Classic? While of course World of Warcraft is a game that literally has been dying since the moment it hit public beta, Cataclysm is most broadly the point in time where people say the game was truly dying because it was the time where the numbers, you know, they went like this, and they went like this, and they went like that. And this was quite spooky around the time, you know? Total Biscuit had just started doing, um, the daily uh, WoW show, I've forgotten its name. Um, you know, it was after the Cataclysm beta was humongous on YouTube and new media. Cataclysm had a really big launch. And then it almost instantly ran out of steam. There was dramas. I mean, I really enjoyed the tuning of the heroic Cataclysm dungeons at the start, but for a lot of people playing in pugs, it ended up being a really horrendous experience with super long queue times in the dungeon finder. Um, they normalized 10 and 25 man difficulty modes, whereas in the past 10 had been easier than 25. So a bunch of people who were focusing in 10, what you could maybe call friends and family rating or maybe a normal mode rating sort of style now, that was just not in the game and it actually would not return to the game until flex mode was added in Siege of Orgrimmar and flex then eventually got renamed to be normal mode, which of course you know today. So the idea of Cataclassic is interesting because it is where things started to change in some ways for the game. And it's something that Ian mentioned offhand to Asmongold, kind of questioning, you know, why it feels like the end of an era to some players, you know, what we do like, what we don't like, what we'd want changed. And a survey uh, came out, the survey actually goes into some detail on that. It's kind of fascinating, it's all just diving into the many different features, saying, you know, what did you like, what do you not like? What would you not like to see? Are there changes that you would enjoy? And even pitching concepts for Cataclysm. And one of the pitched concepts in the one that we saw included things like not adding LFR and retaining pre-Cataclysm features that were, in Cataclysm, streamlined or simplified. I mean, a really good example of that I don't know if you were around for uh, Ghost Crawler's uh, rather famous, or to some people infamous, depends who you ask, uh, WoW, Dungeons Are Hard blog post, like Heroic Dungeons. What do you do? Do you launch with the nerf version that happened like weeks or maybe even like two months or whatever it was after? I don't know. I definitely say launch with the hard version, but I would say that because, uh, well, I did like them. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, they were obviously a bit more willing to go in for some changes with Wrath Classic, and I'd imagine significantly more so now for, um, yeah, for Cataclysm Classic, if they choose to do that. And not always in the way of streamlining, I think, as shown by that survey. So it's pretty bloody interesting stuff. Anyway, that's basically it for the news today. For where we are, I'm now kind of looking into the content that's basically surrounding what's the stuff that's in Dragonflight, how does the end game feel, that sort of thing. So uh, that's what I'm going to be, uh, you know, having some fun with over the next little while. And uh, we're spinning up some uh, sort of big new, you know, lore series and things like that that are all quite fun. Oh, there you go. It's kind of funny with Dragonflight, really. I mean, it's like, hey, dragon riding. That's the thing that feels, you know, uber cool, new and different. But other than that, it's like standard slice of WoW, but with significantly less downsides than we've had recently. And, uh, you know, a few upsides that kind of feel nice, but you can't really, you know, stand from the rooftop shouting about it. It's the weird thing because it's an expansion that I think is really focusing in on, uh, on rebuilding those foundations. It means they kind of, you know, they can't have the uber sexy features that, you know, will blow people away, right? Like, hey, here's player housing and a whole new feature. And I don't know, the, the Island Sanctuary from FF14, you got that too. You know, they, they can't do all of that stuff because they need to get the foundations right. So I suppose for me, it's like, will this just be a good, you know, seven and a half out of 10, eight out of 10, gives us a good slice of WoW, doesn't fight with us, then they can build on that in terms of patches. And then when they're making 11.0, they have like just a nice, friggin' stable foundation for World of Warcraft that they can actually trust. Because uh, if that's the case, then I think we might finally get out of this very bizarre and uh, unfortunate cycle that we've been caught in for the last few days. Few days? Wow, I truly have lost my mind. No, few years. Okay, before I lose my mind any further, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.